So hello, 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 and welcome to the Democratic Candidate Forum for the U.S. House seat. My name is Christina Lucero, member of the Executive Board for the Missoula County Democrats. Thank you all for coming, and thank to thank you to our candidates Cora Newman, Monica Trinnell, and Tom Winter. Thank you to our mo moderator Brian Chapman. Thank you to MCAT, who is broadcasting and streaming this forum on its Facebook page. This forum is sponsored by the Missoula County Democrats. The Missoula County Democrats believe that an informed public is critical to the success of our democracy, and we thank all of you for taking the time to listen and inform yourself tonight. If you have time, please stop at the table outside and sign up for the email list or consider buying tickets to the upcoming Williams Dinner on June 4th at Karis Park. This dinner is a fundraiser for all Missoula County candidates and we have a number of crucial legislative races this year in our county. We are excited to welcome Jennifer Palmieri as, a, as our keynote speaker. I would first like to acknowledge our time together uh, that here in Missoula, we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. I'm actually, uh, my tribe is from Vancouver Island in Canada, and what we like to do um, on the coast is when we um, enter someone else's territory, we ask permission uh, prior to going onto their land. So um, I've been asked to make this land acknowledgement tonight. I'm not from the Salish people here. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge that we honor the path that they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come. We thank the Salish Kalispell Cultural Council for this language, and we know, all, know and acknowledge all the indigenous inhabitants in Western Montana. As part of this acknowledgement, we situate ourselves as guests actively working against colonialism and injustice. I thank the people of Turtle Island, the first people, for the privilege of learning this learning in this space. Thank you. At, thank you. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Brian Chaffin. Brian is an educator, researcher, conservationist, and outdoor guide. During most of the year, he teaches courses on water, climate, and natural resource policy at the University of Montana. But he can also be found guiding wilderness trips in Montana and Idaho, as he is as he has for the past 20 years. As part of this research program, Brian facilitates com conversations between government agencies, conservation NGOs, tribes, industries, and private irrigators. Good evening. Did that work? Well, there we go. Yeah, we're good. Uh, yeah, all right. Welcome, audience. Welcome, candidates. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're really excited to do this. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to start by uh, taking and asking you all if you would observe a moment of silence for the passing of, of Mark Sweeney. Um, his, his sudden passing shocked us all, and we send our thoughts and prayers to his, his family, um, his team, his friends, and his supporters. Thank you very much for, for that. I really appreciate it. I think that I can get this right because the turning of my head is changing this. Um, but, uh, okay, so tonight, the goal of tonight's forum uh, is for our community to meet you, the Democratic candidates for Montana's western seat in the U.S. House of Representatives, and specifically to better understand your vision for the office and why we should support you in the Democratic primary on June 7th. We'll break the forum into three distinct parts tonight. So the first part, each part will be about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, the first part, we'll ask you some questions so that the audience can get to know you uh, better as people, as Montanans, and as public servants. Then we'll drill down into some specific issues and we'll finish with questions directly from the audience that's here tonight. Um, audience, to you, while the candidates are speaking during this first 25 minutes, please feel free to write down questions on the note cards you were handed on your way in. If anybody needs a note card, please raise your hand at this time, and someone from the Montana Democratic um, Committee will come by and give you one. We'll collect your questions in about 25 minutes, and I will read your questions aloud uh, and during the last 20 minutes of the forum. 
We'll keep your responses tonight, candidates, fairly short in order to get through a range of topics. Um, you'll get about a minute to a minute and a half to answer each question, and I'll continue to mix up who goes first. Uh, the point of this particular forum and this particular um, setup, if you will, is to have more of a conversation. Ready to get started? Yep. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, many of us have heard radio, TV, newspaper interviews. We've, heard, we've started to hear your stump speeches. We've started to become very familiar with them, and I appreciate all of them. So I want to start a little bit differently tonight, and I'd like to give you the opportunity to introduce yourselves to the audience as people. Who are you? What experiences have shaped your core values? And what is you pushing you towards and through a life of public service? Why don't you start by telling us a brief story, perhaps from your childhood, youth, or young adulthood, that helps define your character and personality. And you'll have two minutes to answer this question. And one thing I didn't mention to you earlier is that you will, in the back, you will see a yellow card when you have, you know, you know, soccer style. You'll see a yellow card when you have about 10 to 15 seconds left, and the red card will be to stop. And I'll, and I'll help keep that time as well if you go a little over. So just to, just to repeat, please tell us a story that defines you and tells a little bit about your character. And tonight we'll start with Cora. Thank you. Thank you, Missoula County Dems, all of the organizers for having us tonight. It's wonderful to be here. So my name is Cora Newman, um, and something that's shaped me, if you followed my story, um, as you mentioned earlier, you know that my family lost my dad in a lumber mill accident when I was a, when I was a baby. Um, and one of the things that I haven't necessarily shared is my mother, the story of my mother. So she was 21 years old when my dad died. She had two babies under two. She, didn't have a, uh, she hadn't graduated from high school. She didn't have a job at the time. And she had to figure out, basically overnight, how to pick herself up and take care of my brother and I. Uh, she moved to Bozeman and settled us there when I was an infant. And I learned from my mother that you cannot give up. When the going gets tough, you show up and you care for the ones, that, the, the people that you love and your community. I learned that persistence from her. And she showed us every day what it's like to wake up and work hard to make ends meet just to take care of my brother and I. And so that's the kind of toughness and persistence that I took with me into my career. In the darkest of times when our communities, our rural communities and tribal communities have been through some of the hardest periods uh, in their history, I show up and I listen and I deliver. And it's a, it's a, it's a toughness that comes from, is, is led by the heart and is led by a commitment to care for our communities uh, and make sure um, that, that our communities can thrive. And so that's what I'm going to do from Congress. I will bring that with me to take on price gougers to take on and fight for housing that we can afford, to take on wealthy outside special interests that are trying to buy up Montana out from underneath us and lock us out of our public lands. That's the kind of, of persistence that I learned from my mother uh, at that very young age and that I will bring with me to serve Montana from Congress. Thanks, Cora. Monica, how about you? Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Am I on or do I need to flip it on? There you go. Pesky on button. Am I on now? You're on. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. I grew up um, on a ranch in eastern Montana with my nine brothers and sisters. I'm six of ten. Um, and just a couple of stories that I'll share with you. Um, my dad used to come home, and he would say, come on, all you kids. We're going to go outside and do something. So in the summer evenings, we would be outside playing baseball. And my dad had a rule that he was always the pitcher and every pitch was a strike. So he wanted to move us through the rotation without having somebody hijack the whole game. So we learned that when it was our turn at bat, we got up and we took our best swing. Um, but we were outside a lot. We went sledding under the northern lights and riding on Sundays after mass, which we would just do these things together. And my dad found this um, bike, and I think it might have been in the dump, and it was a three-seater bike. And he used to take us out for these bike rides in Mile City, which became a family experience that we had, and we all loved to bike. And so I don't know if any of you have done the Rat Pod, but that's something that I've done with my brothers and has been just a really great experience um, through the course of, of my life. Um, so just ha being deeply, deeply shaped by this place, by the outdoors, and having an incredible sense of belonging in this country and having a love for it, our natural world, 
which really led to me falling in love with rowing, which is an outdoor sport and which you get to do and you're very much in the moment and in the, you know, in the place. And so I think that that's one thing that has just deeply connected me across time and years and communities is having a real sense of connection with our outdoors. I mean, there's nothing like skating on the Muscle Shell River and walk, walking around a lot of beaver dams. So that's something that from my childhood that I still carry with me. Thanks, Monica. Tom? First off, Missoula County Dems, it's so good to be here. I actually live in Polson now. Um, until before then, I actually represented a portion of our city and a large portion of our county in the Western District in the House. And I have to tell you, just being a former community member and an honorary one, because I'm here three days out of the week to work, seeing this library built here and the time and effort that other generations, current generations, and the people here put to building this community and civic resource says everything about this part of the state and why it's a privilege to even be before you today. You did this. And I, I still, I'm amazed. It's absolutely beautiful. Now, we're talking about times that began our lives and stories that brought us here. I was born in the Midwest. Uh, my family and I now all live here. I moved here when I was around 20. Um, did that thing where you live in a truck. For a while, I lived in an Indian porch in March. Um, eventually, I found my footing here in Montana. But I should say that from the beginning, the beginning even in the, in the Midwest, I saw what it meant to do public service and organizing. My parents were, there's a question up there? Your mic, your mic. But no one said anything. <laughs> you really don't want to hear politicians this bad? Am I grooming now? No. It's definitely there on. You there you go. Now it's too do I go away from somebody? Is your phone next to it, maybe? Save me. Save everybody. Yeah. Yell? Good. Good. Hey, you don't all have to stand up. I'm just going to do it now. You're good. Wait here. He can try it again. Try it again. Try it again. Try it again. Now? Yes. Yeah. The booming voice of God. Here I am. I hope you heard the beginning. I was saying that I work. I come from Kansas. I come from a family of people who have been an activist for their entire lives. Some of my earliest memories, and this matters for today, we must acknowledge today the Senate failed to protect our right to choose. They failed to protect that right. Watching my parents be involved in the right to an abortion in the state of Kansas made me who I am today and put me here and put me in the legislature. During the abortion wars in the 90s when they were murdering doctors, in their abortion doctors in Wichita, Dr. Tiller, others, my parents stepped up. My father was the head of Planned Parenthood for Kansas and Mid-Missouri. My mother volunteered there as well. We had to leave our Catholic parish because of our views. My brother was kicked out of his fourth grade class. Watching what has happened today, I see a red card here, let's finish up. Watching what has happened today and watching the culmination of what has been a failed effort to protect us from a government and especially a Republican party that wants to take something from us, our right to reproductive autonomy, has been deeply, deeply heartening because it is a fight we must continue, but it has also educated me in what it means to be a public servant. When I first moved here, I volunteered for Planned Parenthood as a 22-year-old. I believe deeply in the right to an abortion, but I also believe deeply in the dignity of every individual person in Montana. And I know that that value carries through in our campaign and in all our campaigns. So, Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, the next question will start with Monica, and it's, when did you first com uh, contemplate public service? Was there a person, an event, was there something that inspired you particularly to go into public service? Does anybody remember where they were on January 21st of 2017? I think they're all... Check, check. Yeah, I think you might be. says on. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Does anybody remember where they were on January 21st of 2017? Yeah. I was in Helena with my three daughters, and we marched. Um, we did the Women's March. So the day after the election in 2016, I was in a hearing at the Public Service Commission trying to get a wind project built, and the commissioners said, everything's changed now. We don't have to follow the rule of law. And they changed the rates for this wind project at the hearing 
because there was an election. And I went and I marched with my daughters and we carried signs and we walked around the Capitol and my husband came and my sister came and we, something inside me shifted. And I understood that democracy happens because we make it happen. We show up and we act and we participate and it's, I mean, everybody in here voted, I'm sure. I'm sure you all voted in the school board election. You are the outliers. But we have to give people someone to vote for. There are 25 seats right now that are uncontested in the Montana legislature. And all of those incumbents voted the wrong way on the abortion bills. So I knew in that moment that I needed to step up. And then I was doing another wind project, and one of the commissioners said, those wind turbines are dangerous. They cause cancer. And I knew we needed systemic change, that the case-by-case -case work I've been doing in Montana isn't enough. We need more. And so that started my trajectory to being here today. Thanks, Monica. Cora, how about you? <clears throat> yeah, I, sh I shared my story. Um, but it really is what motivated me to serve. Um, and it's what's motivating me to run for, for this office. Um, losing my dad in a lumber mill accident, later watching my stepdad have to commute long hours just for the next good paying job. Um, those things motivated me to go on and study and work in public health. And I did this because I knew that if we had been closer to good care, my father may have survived. And if, we had had, if my stepdad had had better paying work nearby, we may not have had to leave my beloved hometown. And so I've been motivated to serve at the community level and now to run for office because I am committed to making sure that other families don't have to face the pain and struggle that my family went through. That is why I have worked with rural and tribal communities to increase access to health care, to spur job creation, to protect our public lands. Because just because you're in a rural community doesn't mean that you should have fewer opportunities, that you should suffer from lack of access to health care and, God forbid, lose a loved one. And so my work has been committed to making sure, uh, to building alliances uh, with rural leaders, to, to showing up and listening to what communities need. Because you know what? Local leaders and community members know what their communities need best. And so my career has been committed to making sure that we increase access to services um, and improve the lives of rural communities. And today, we're facing some of the hardest challenges this state has ever faced. Thanks, Cora. Tom, you talked about it a little in your intro as well, but uh, if you could expand on what inspired you to pursue public service. Absolutely. You know, I think it's Medicaid expansion, which seems like a billion years ago to all of us, I think, with everything that's happened. Um, prior to the pandemic, in a different world, um, not necessarily a better one, Trump was president at the time, but our state legislature wanted to take away health care from 110 to 117,000 of our fellow Montanans who made between, I believe, $16,000 and $22,000 a year. Some of the legislators in here will say I got my numbers wrong, but it's close. What they wanted to do was take people, our neighbors, who were struggling, who were being screwed out of a good job, a dignified wage, but more so than that, were about to lose their health care. They wanted to take it away. I ran for the legislature because I know and have seen up close and personally what it means to be born with chronic illness, what it means to have avenues foreclosed to you because of your health, and the cruelty of that bad lottery ticket you might get. It's unfair, it's not right, and it's not a Montana community value to harm people who are struggling. So I ran for office in the legislature in a district that voted for Trump plus 11 points and was held by a Republican, the Speaker of the House's son. I ran to make sure we would not lose Medicaid expansion. I was one of many votes, and some of the legislators in here who did far more work than I did are in the audience tonight. I thank you, and we should all thank you. But I must say that seeing the possibility of a small, committed minority of bigots and people who dislike the poor simply because they are poor try to take more from them that has already been taken made me want to be a public servant in this state. And that was the genesis. Thanks, Tom. Thank Appreciate you. It. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. 
Uh, I really appreciate these opening comments. It's nice for us to get to know you a little bit and put these stories together. Um, but I'm going to ask a question that at this stage in the race, you might not have gotten yet. And I might be wrong about this. Um, but tell us a little bit about your day-to-day, -day, right? Tell us about your week-to-week. -week. What does the life of a candidate in the primary look like right now? And I ask this. So what does it look like for a regular Montanan to run for a House seat in the U.S.? We'll start with Tom on this one. I'm feeling very regular today because I woke up on my couch because my um, brother-in-law and my sister came up to stay with me in Polson, and I had to race down here to um, pick up some flooring and see after the chicken that my campaign found when we were delivering um, trash to the Lake County Transfer Station. Someone had abandoned a small chicken and it ran into our arm, my campaign manager's arms, who's here, like a dog. And so now, not only do I drive around the state with a feral chicken, I also have a dog named Gary. A campaign manager named Blake, volunteers, and myself, and usually just whatever I'm trying to move to my place back and forth because it's still under construction. Um, and I smell terrible today. I didn't even have time to shower, so I apologize. <laughs> Woo. Feeling very normal, in other words. Uh, but I do, you know, this question I think we get, and I'll, I'll go quick here, but the question about, you know, what constitutes a normal Montanan, we are all normal Montanans. Everyone who's a Montanan is a normal Montanan. There is nothing exceptional or not exceptional about anyone who goes for this office. And, you know, oftentimes I think we, all of us, Very, very real please to show that not only are we real, but we have work, we struggle. We all have, and we all differently do every day. But I, and so, you know, whether or not I'm covered in, you know, chicken, whatever you call it, as I'm walking in here, uh, doesn't make me any more qualified or not qualified to be before you. But what does is the understanding that we make our lives here. This place is still being built. We have the great privilege to live in Montana, a place where we are still building it. It is still a work in progress in the best and sometimes the worst way possible. And I think that what pulls all of us into public service is the knowledge of that potential to change the trajectory toward a better outcome. Even if it means you're finding chickens at the dump, trying to fix your house, begging to find a refrigerator that works, it's all part of it. Thanks. Well, uh, let's, how about Cora? All right, thank you so much. Well, first of all, it takes a family to run a campaign. Um, I have two kids, my husband and I are raising our two, um, our two teenagers in Bozeman, and we're surrounded by four generations of family, and so I'm really, really lucky. I have my grandmother, my mom, my aunts and uncles, my sister, um, and they are able to help us uh, move forward and, and, and support me while I campaign. It is definitely a family affair. Uh, really proud of my kids. My daughter, Timea, just placed first in state and is going to nationals for speech and debate. Really, really proud of her. My son is a musician, and he's playing in the marching band. He'll be playing in the Memorial Day Parade on Monday to honor our veterans. So I'm um, really grateful that I am, and I would not be able to do this without my family. Um, I do still work. I'm working in public health, so continuing to deliver services and support to health workers and tribal communities as they we come through and continue to navigate COVID. Um, I'm really honored. I recently received the Montana Pub Public Health Association Award for Exemplary Service. Um, I couldn't do it without some of my colleagues that are here today, like Dr. Lauren Wilson, Dr. Deshane Barnett. Um, and so continuing to work together with my colleagues to deliver care. I also have a reproductive health project that I'm working on with four generations of rural and tribal women. And it couldn't be more timely. Uh, because, as we all know, our reproductive justice is under threat. Um, and finally, I'm campaigning, and I'm building a really strong campaign. My campaign is in, continued to be in the top 10% um, of challenger candidates, um, and we are building a campaign. Uh, we're keeping pace with Ryan Zinke, um, and we've beat him on public lands. Um, so we are, we are building an operation that can absolutely win in November. Thanks, Ron. Monica. A day in the life. Okay. <laughs> so last night when we were driving home from, I can't remember where I was actually, Kalispell or somewhere, I put a cup in the back of my minivan and I said, okay, that's my kitchen. And then I, I think I took my shoes off and I said, that's my living room in the back of my minivan. So it's been a lot, a lot of miles on the minivan. Um, and also, it's the, I have made a commitment to my family to come home every night, wherever I am, which is the great part about Missoula in this district. It's the heart of the district. So I'm able to come back every night, uh, reasonably. And so I get the privilege of driving my 14-year-old to school in the morning. 
who basically spends the entire time not talking to me and making a point of so I'm her least favorite person in the world, but I am really committed to being in those moments, whatever that looks like. It means um, doing call time to people in eastern Montana who say, I knew your dad. And then having this really surprising, lovely conversation and a connection that I never would have made. So those are the moments of, I think, grace that have been brought to me in this campaign, which has been really challenging. Um, it means um, just the, you know, the long hours of trying to be a lawyer with a practice. Last Friday, we got a decision um, with 350 Montana challenged the constitutionality of the pre-approval statute, um, and we won that. I got that decision last Friday. So lots of hours. Um, and lots of exhaustion. Thanks. Appreciate those. Really appreciate those stories. Transitioning again, if elected, you will inevitably be asked to fight an uphill battle to preserve the livelihoods and spaces of Montana, often from powerful out-of-state interests who wish to extract wealth on the backs of Montana's people and landscape. What gives you the drive and stamina to keep up this fight in Congress? And we'll start this with Monica. Um, so you can look at what I've been doing for the last 25 years and the decision I got on Friday with 350 Montana against Northwestern Energy. Uh, my track record speaks for itself. I've gone into a courtroom, um, been the only woman in the courtroom against 10 men on the other side, and I have won. I've prevailed. I've gone up against Cargill on behalf of my 90-year-old chief farmer, and we won. So I know the long, hard, tedious, boring hours it takes to prevail. I've done it. That's what I've been doing. When Northwestern wanted to saddle us with replacement power costs for the plant that had gone down, I challenged that. And what they did in response was to dump a dump truck of documents on my desk. And you know what I did? I read them. And we won. So I've been doing it, I've been on the ground, and I grew up on a ranch, I rode in two Olympics, 10 years of rowing at the elite level, you do the same thing over and over and over again until you get a little bit better. So this is what I've done. It's the core of who I am, and I will carry that with me. To Congress. It's, it's who I am, it's what I've lived, and I, I've delivered for Montana, and I will continue to do that in Congress. Thanks, Monica. Cora? Um, I'm not a politician. I'm not a lawyer. I am a community organizer. I've spent my career delivering results for rural and tribal communities, which includes increasing access to maternal health care, fighting for improved nutrition, emergency response, um, and making sure that right now one of the things that we need more than anything across the state and country is increasing access to and improving mental health care. A couple of examples of, of the types of values and work that I'll take with me to Washington. When COVID hit our state two years ago, I'd worked on, uh, on pandemics, so I know a thing or two, unfortunately, about pandemics, and I knew it was not if but when it came to our state. It was going to be devastating, especially for our most remote communities and our tribal communities. And so I reached out to my colleagues across the state, and together we mobilized a quarter million dollars in aid, training, support, and resources for our communities to help them get through one of the scariest times that many of our community members have ever lived through. So that is the kind of focus and uh, support I bring to the work that I do. When Ryan Zinke slashed public lands, when he became head of the interior, the first thing he did was start slashing public lands. I was called in to Utah based on my background organizing diverse coalitions uh, at the community level and protecting public lands to bring together farmers and ranchers, tribes, business owners, hunters and anglers to fight back against that, the slashing of those lands, and we won. So I have stood up and held outside special interests accountable in the past. I show up and fight for rural communities, and that is what I will do from Washington. Thanks, Cora. Tom? You want to take the question again? Yeah, question was, if elected, mm -hmm. you have to fight an uphill battle. 
uh, Certainly. against a lot of interests, powerful interests specifically, that want to extract Montana's beauty, goods, services, mm -hmm. and livelihoods on the backs of Montanans. What will you do? What keeps the stamina going for you in Congress? Well, I mean, you know, your question is about we're going to be fighting on behalf of Montanans from forces and people and corporations and a government sometimes who wants to take advantage of them. I, we, all three of us, will never fight as hard as the people who are struggling that we're trying to represent. There is no question about that. The only thing that keeps, I think, anyone who aspires to true public service going is just how much harder the people we hope to assist have it. I mean, when I was going door to door for my legislative race, you know, what, I think a sixth of my district um, was in Westview Trailer Park. It became very clear that they were under threat of eviction. At some point, if not now, in the very near future. And it still looms over them. We were, I brought legislation in that case, and it worked my ass off. I should not curse in a library. I worked very hard in the legislature to ensure that we brought transformative landlord-tenant law protections to ensure that they couldn't be turfed out of their mobile homes. And then they would lose their home, which was the only thing they would own of any value, and, but have the land taken out from under them. That was defeated on a bipartisan basis by landlords who were Republicans and Democrats. It was difficult. It was disappointing. It was the first bill I ever ran. And I was laughed out of a room because I was trying to change it for people who worked so much harder than any legislator. The thing that we do every day, sitting in front of you, has nothing on the people who are working, literally, and it's not an anecdote, well, I mean, it is an anecdote, but working two jobs to ensure that they can afford rent for them and their children. We fight for them. And that's the drive, and knowing that that's the stakes is what gets me moving every day. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. We're going to transition into issue-based questions next, uh, but as a prelude, uh, what I would call a semi-rapid-fire round, uh, we'll <laughs> 60 seconds to answer this question. Um, what is the first issue you would work for in Congress um, that is important to Montanans? And we'll go Cora, Tom, Monica. So the one thing that I hear above all else when I travel the district um, no matter how small the town is, is the housing crisis. We are going through an acute housing crisis that's not only impacting our working families, increasing child poverty, um, and everything that goes along with it, but it's, in, it's, it's impacting our small businesses um, and our service industries. So whether it's health workers, teachers, nurses, firefighters, um, everyone I meet with is saying, is, is talking about the difficulty they have bringing in critical support and resources and personnel to keep our communities safe, to continue to, to teach our kids in school, and to respond to emergencies when, there, when there's a medical emergency. Um, and, it, and it ties back to housing. And so the first thing that I will address, um, and I'm already coming up with a plan now from Congress, is increasing affordable housing stock in this state. There are really incredible solutions um, that we can activate from the federal level, uh, and that's number one. Uh, this is going to sound so wonky and boring. Bring teeth to the National Labor Relations Board. No one can afford housing regardless if you make minimum wage. What is it, seven fifty, eight bucks? Yeah, your house could be $100,000. It could be $200,000. You're not going to get the down payment. We're not going to fix this crisis. We need to ensure that we fix inequality first. And I will do that when I first move there, when I first get into Congress. First off, I think one of the second bill I wrote in the legislature was to tax out-of-staters just the tiniest little tiny amount. And what that would have done on their second home millionaire vacation rentals, that would have made zeroed out taxes on every middle class home in the state. Zero taxes. Would have allowed people to live here and stay in their homes as the values go up. I think I'm, you're going to hear me hearkening back to my time in the legislature often because I did have a day one where I was a freshman in a place that was hostile to me for many reasons, including representing Missoula, being a Democrat, being young, being progressive. Right out the gate, we came out for housing, for renters to ensure that people who owned homes could stay. And that, I think, shows where my values lie because I have already written those bills. And, you know, change one thing, Montana, United States government, federal, you got the bill already. Thanks, Alvia, for that answer. Uh, so now we'd like to learn a little bit more about your Oh, well, Monica needs to. Oh, Monica, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that I, have, was... I have a lot of people talking for me. I got it. I just, I just got excited to move to the next the issue set. Thanks for catching me, Thanks. team. I can yeah. probably take care of myself, but where is my volume okay? I just want to make sure. Okay, is that better? Yeah. 
I'm usually the one person they say to be more quiet. Here. So. Do you mind putting it right there? No. Okay. That's going to help you a lot. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'm the middle kid, so I have a fear of being left out anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so what is the first thing I will tackle in Congress? It's going to look a lot like the work that I've been doing here in Montana the last 25 years. I think first and foremost, we need to restore our community's trust in each other. And that starts by listening to each other and talking to each other. I've been doing a lot of work on climate change and energy. The energy transition is happening. I grew up close by where Coal Strip is. I know where that line goes. Um, and I've been working on these issues here in Montana on the ground for the last 25 years. So for me, it's really restoring the dignity and the integrity of our middle class which means bringing good jobs here. It means being their voice in Congress, making people feel heard across this new district, which is between Glacier and Yellowstone National Parks. What an incredible opportunity we have to have this beautiful place be represented. So I will do the work to protect and defend our climate, which I've been doing for the last 25 years. Thank you all. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so now we're going to move into more issues, which you've all started to tee up. Uh, first, I'd like to ask the audience, if you've written questions down on your cards, please pass those questions to the end, either center or the ends, and uh, uh, members of the Missoula County Democrats will come by and get those. Thank you very much. First question is about voting rights, and we'll, we'll go uh, Tom Monica Cora on this one. And the, the question about voting rights is, Voting rights are under attack in many states, including here in Montana. As an example, a bill to end Election Day voter registration was passed in the most recent legislative session, although now enjoined by the court, um, despite Montana voters clearly rejecting a ballot initiative to end Election Day registration six years prior. What actions will you take in Congress to protect voting rights for all citizens? The John Lewis Voting Rights Act must be passed right now. Full stop. But we have to move forward from there. Again, broken record. I worked in the legislature on, in the state admin committee on issues around voting. I dealt with some of the people who brought these bills that are trying to take away all of our rights to the franchise. I know why they're doing it. I looked in their eyes when I was trying to make sure we could get people to do, um, say, it was, uh, what was it, online voter registration? Just so like if you lived in Sealy Lake, you didn't have to drive all the way down here to get registered and then go all the way back up and call the way back down. It was just a simple bill. Most states have it. I worked with um, the State Elections Board of Hawaii and other states especially to make it possible for Native people to feel comfortable doing so as well in reservation communities. And the thing I ran into was two things. One, why should lazy people be allowed to vote? And two, what's a PDF? So we have two issues. Uh, and I, we're in a democratic space. And I often, most of my constituents when I was elected were Republicans, I should say. So I respect individual voters. But the party, the people who run it, they have no real concern for anyone but themselves. And what they're doing is they're purposely trying to disenfranchise young people, the poor, and native, because they know they will not vote for their bigoted policies. Acknowledging that is the first step. But the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is a way we could concretely fix it immediately. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, I think we, we said Monica next. Then Cora. Did you? Yeah. So a couple of things that I would focus on are the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. Those clearly need to be passed. Um, and I think shout out to Forward Montana, the plaintiff, and the lawyers at the Upper Seven Law Firm who were instrumental in bringing challenges and getting injunctions to the bad voting bills that were passed here by the state legislature. Um, but in terms of the question of how do we get young folks to vote, um, I think that's a really critical question. And for the last week, I have been approached by so many people telling me their abortion story. And many of them are young women. And they say, they've said to me, I don't feel heard. Nobody is representing me. And these are people who say, I can give you $10, I can give you $20, maybe I could give you $100. I'm proud that 80% of my campaign finance money is from Montana. Nobody else can come close to that. 
in this race, but campaign finance reform is really, really important, and I will work on that. Thank you. Yeah, again, support the John Lewis Rights Act. And I also want to thank all of the statewide voting rights advocates um, and our tribal leaders for continuing to protect the right for every single Montanan to have access to the ballot box. But the other thing that's really concerning and is, it has a huge impact on our democracy is money in politics. I strongly support ending Citizens United. Just because you're wealthy does not mean that you should have undue influence on our elections. Unfortunately, my opponent, Monica Trinnell, has a super PAC that's running lies and ads against me on TV. And while she claims to also stand against money in politics, she has not spoken up and condemned these lies on TV. This is everything that's wrong with politics. We do not, as Democrats, need to be taking each other down at a time so delicate in our history. We need to be talking about the issues that matter to Montanans. Housing, instability, jobs, supporting our small businesses. And when I am in Congress, I will fight to make sure not only that every voice is heard, but that we get money out of politics. I would like a chance to respond to that personal, personal attack that we said we weren't going to be doing. So by definition, a super PAC isn't mine. And anything that's not true, you can surely correct. Well, that's you have money. the opportunity to also condemn it. Uh, if there is something that's not true, Cora, then point out what it is. But it's not mine. So that's by definition. We can move on because I think the people here want to hear where we are in the issues and mm -hmm. not the ad hominem attacks. So prepare to. We're gonna, Thank we're you, gonna, Brian. We're going to jump around a little bit in this uh, section. We're going to go from issue to issue. And they, the next issue is that the sovereignty of 12 tribal nations predates statehood of Montana. Yet indigenous peoples are overrepresented in the, incar in the incarcerated of the state and experience health and safety disparities due to a lack of resources. This leads to two questions that I'd like you to think about and answer in a minute and a half. Um, first, how do you plan to use your position to encourage fellow lawmakers in Congress to understand these complexities, which is a big challenge with Native issues in, in Congress? And two, in what ways do you, will you work towards creating and fostering relationships with Montana's indigenous communities and set goals that can be achieved during your term? And we will do this in order of Monica, Cora, and Tom. Uh, building relationships with our, our tribes is um, a long project. Um, for me, I went to grade school in Ashland at St. Labre um, on the reservation, and that was a really interesting perspective. I've met with the Blackfeet Tribal Council. I've met with the CSKAT Tribal Council, uh, you know, with the chairs of the councils. I've had really, really fantastic conversations. We toured um, the college um, in Pablo and really what is happening there, seeing that as a flagship school, not just for Montana, but for the country. There are 54 bachelor degrees offered at that school, which is amazing. So, but I think most of all, and hearing uh, tonight Secretary Holland talking about um, really the gross injustices that have happened, what I've heard uh, from our tribal peoples is the intergenerational trauma and the path forward and the healing that has to happen. So for me, it's about listening, it's about education, it's about hearing the need for language, for education, and for acknowledging all of the history that we have to try to restore and repair and try to find a path forward. So the tribal governments, working with them, not as their direct representative, but as their advocate, as a person who can listen and understand and try to help change happen from building relationships on the ground. And I think that just takes a lot of time, a lot of commitment, and a lot of showing up, which I've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. So I've spent over 20 years working on access to health care with rural and tribal communities. And I'm really proud of the support that I have from tribal leaders across the state. I have worked with all tri 12 tribes here in Montana. And when we talk about relationships with tribes, it is, we're talking about nation to nation sovereign relationships. 
We're talking about honoring treaties that have been broken over and over again. And at the federal level, I plan to work, on, work with leaders like Sharice Davids, indigenous leaders that are in our Congress now, um, who I have a great relationship with, um, working together with them to make sure that we deliver for our tribal communities. I don't, one of the things that's, that's a, a dev devastating but true fact is that each Native American, indigenous American, receives $3,000 to the $9,000 that a non-indigenous person gets for their, to cover their health care. These are the kinds of disparities that create the inequality, that leads to poverty, that leads to incarceration, that leads to negative health outcomes. When I was working on COVID across the state, all of my indigenous colleagues across Montana lost between one and four people. That is not okay. And that is happening on our watch. So I am deeply committed to partnering directly with our indigenous leaders Nation to na in a nation to nation respectful relationship to fix those absolutely atrocious inequalities. Absolutely, and I think all of us here are staunch advocates for the Native community within Montana and Pan Indigenous community in America. You know, I think humility is absolutely essential when working, especially as a white person. I live on the reservation myself working as a white person and speaking about how you're going to work with sovereign nations of native people who are here. We must acknowledge that a genocide occurred. A genocide is occurring. And white settler colonialist violence is a continuation. It didn't just happen once. Our grandparents didn't just do it. It happens right now, every day. The things that are happening to native communities, the differential rates of poverty, violence, specifically missing and murdered indigenous women, violence against women, that is a continuation of what happened when white people violently took over this state from the very beginning. I want to be one of the Congress people who acknowledges that and who, with the humility and the crushing weight of that awful history, works to ensure that we, we will never fix what occurred, but know that you can be a representative for a government that can represent the individual Native Americans who are Americans through and through, but who are also also members of a sovereign nation that predates you by far, predates this government by far, and has just as much validity as the United States government. With this, I think, and I want to say, too, I can't see the red card or the yellow oh, one. You got 10 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Your chair has a very large head. <laughs> um, sorry, Shibu. The, um, we need to acknowledge from the beginning that that occurred, that that happened. My campaign is working with a national Native American organization <clears throat> on speaking toward land back, bringing back federal lands to the tribes specifically and actually doing it. Thanks, Tom. We're going to switch gears to climate. Um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about in my classes. Uh, by the way, I should just quickly mention that one of the things I was supposed to say in my intro is I'm not here in my official capacity as a University of Montana professor. I have to say that I'm here as a concerned citizen and volunteer, just so we're all clear. Um, I don't represent the, the uh, opinion of the university in any way. But Climate scientists, and many at the university would agree with me, have been sounding alarm bells that time is running out to avoid major fallout on our changing climate for a while. Um, however, despite their calls and despite worsening extreme events such as drought and the increasing frequency and intensity of wildfires, especially here in Montana, we haven't seen much urgency from Congress in addressing this. So what are your specific plans to address climate change and related impacts as a member of Congress? We'll start with Cora, we'll move to Tom, and then end with Monica. So, yes, climate change is here. It's no longer existential. I have teenagers, and they are facing a future that they are they're truly afraid of what is to come. And many young people that I know, my children included, but many young people, don't know whether or not they want to have children. It's heartbreaking. So that's on the, the, the side that we have, where we have to think about the, the, the planet that we're passing on to our children. And from the Montana perspective, our two biggest industries in the state are outdoor recreation, and agriculture, and both are being hit dramatically by drought and climate change. So number one, protecting public lands. They are the washing machine of our air and water, making sure that those stay uh, protected. Number two, investing in continued research by some of our universities like MSU in um, soil health, regenerative agriculture, resilient crops, livestock health. Our farmers and ranchers are some of our best partners on addressing climate change. Um, and how we move forward as a state, including on food security. And number three, renewable energy. 
Uh, we, are, we have a proud history of producing, a, 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 of being an energy leader in this country. Um, and so making sure that investments at the federal level are directed to and incentivizing investments in water, hydro, solar, um, and making sure that those jobs um, and the growth in that, in that um, industry here in Montana also supports good paying jobs for Montanans and for unions. You know, we have, the IPCC says we have three years to start to stop burning carbon as much as we do now. We will not meet that target. I'm one of the people who is hesitating to have a family because of what we face and because of 40 years of inaction on the part of our federal government. We need actual action immediately. Joe Biden, the president, put forward in his Build Back Better Act 500, believe, $500 billion dollars to bring high voltage transmission lines to places where the wind blows continuously, like Montana, to the wealthier cities of the coast. I view this as a resource extraction model that we can resuscitate and not harm our state. Butte made itself one of the richest towns between Minneapolis and Seattle based on pulling copper out of the ground to fund the war effort. It completely destroyed the environment. What we have the opportunity to do with our almost constantly blowing wind just outside the district on the Rocky Mountain front is harness something, exploit our resources in a way that does not harm our environment, that enriches our communities, and also contributes to the national security of our country. I would say that the blowing wind, specifically in Great Falls, that drives all my friends crazy over there, it is one of the great economic facts for Montana's future. It is also one of the great national security interests in the United States to ensure that we harness it on behalf of a non-oil and gas-powered future. Now, when I say this, I'm not just some crackpot. This was put forward by the president. It was voted down by Republicans and one Democrat or two. We have the opportunity to do this. My campaign does not take oil money. We are on board for the Green New Deal and climate justice. And we have to ensure that we run campaigns that show that we are anti-oil and gas industry from day one. Next time. Monica. I'll give you four specific policies. End fossil fuel subsidies. Two, demand a full payment of federal leases. Three, let's modernize the national electric grid. And number four, let's deploy EV charging stations across Montana, across the country for sure. But in Montana, those are low-hanging fruit things that we can do right now. There are lots and lots of other ways that we can come at this. The building industry definitely has to get on board and get behind a zero carbon emission policy going forward, and we have incredible opportunities. The housing issue brings opportunities with moving to zero carbon emissions in the building industry. But in the electrical generation space and the transmission space, this is something that Montana can and should be a leader on. Our wind in Montana is winter peaking. It's a perfect complement for the wind in the gorge, which serves the load in California. Our hydro makes this congressional district in western Montana almost fossil free, fuel free for our electricity. In Lincoln and Sanders County, they don't use gas at all because they can't physically get it through. So they are already heating their homes with electricity. So this, is, this district gives us incredible opportunities to start forward on these issues, and these are things that we can do. Because of the work I've been doing here in Montana for 25 years on these issues, I'm positioned to lead on this nationally and to deliver those results here to Montana. Thanks, all of you. You've all mentioned housing at some point. I've heard all of you talk about that a little bit. But I want to ask a specific question about housing, um, because it's on the mind of many people here tonight and, and many people in Missoula. Housing is the biggest expense that most Montanan households have, and the cost of housing has risen dramatically over the past few years. What do you see as the most promising policy solutions to address housing affordability for regular people in Montana, specifically out of Congress? And we'll go, we'll start with you, Monica, and we'll go Monica, Tom, and Cora. So the uh, way to get to solve any problem is to correctly diagnose it. And in this district in western Montana, the pressure points on the housing uh, problem are different. Butte used to be a city of 100,000 people. Now it's a city of 30,000. The solutions for Butte look different than they do for Missoula or Bozeman or Whitefish. In Whitefish, we've seen the Alpenglow apartments get built, partnering with Homeward. Shout out to the work that they're doing. That's amazing, the deed, restrict, uh, the deed restrictions that will be there in place for a long time. 38 units got built there. Uh, one in four 
uh, projects in Montana right now that can be built is actually getting funded. So out of the federal government, what I can do in Congress to help the housing issue, which is so much a local problem, is really the levers of funding. But figuring out how to make that funding meet the needs on the ground. So making it easier to use, getting it to our developers and our builders, and making sure those projects that are eligible are actually getting funded. And that the tax credits are going where they need to go so that people who are capable of building and accountable for what they're building can actually do that. And the other thing that I think uh, Congress can and should do, in Missoula, in Lolo, last night I heard two people actually own all of the commercial building space in Lolo. So making sure that, that corporate investors are not getting the same financial incentives that you or I or young families are getting to own a home. So stopping that and stopping the rental market is something that Congress can do as well. Uh, thank you for the question. You know, we look out on a city that is at a turning point, I think, a turning point that's already been approached by Bozeman in the direction they have gone is much to the loss of the people of Bozeman and the state. It's an affordable place no longer. Missoula is already on its way there unless we take drastic action. Part of the reason it would be important to be in Congress representing a place like Missoula that I know very well, or Polson for that matter, is the knowledge that we must say is our policy around zoning our single-family homeowner policy, looking this direction, was built over the course of 80 years to ensure that wealthy white people didn't have to live next to native, Hispanic, or black people. It was. We are the inheritors of that, whether we like it or not. And we gain from that, whether we like it or not. And what we must do is change it. You can use federal housing policy, federal money, to incentivize states and municipalities and counties to change their zoning so it's not a, a different form of segregation either by poverty or by race. You can do that. I would support that. There are laws out there that are on the book that are possible to be put forward. I should say also in the city of Missoula, there are more than enough Section 8 housing vouchers. It's that there's not enough housing. And it's also that there's not enough landlords who will actually rent to people who are using housing vouchers. That's called source of income discrimination. It has a name. It's a discrimination against people who are poor so they can rent to people because the assumption by the landlord is that those people will be dirtier or more prone to whatever. It's discrimination. We can end that with law. Right now what we do is we are pumping money into a housing system that basically incentivizes people to put as much money as possible into their extremely expensive single family homes and scare everyone else away from being a part of it. We must acknowledge it, we must change it, and my campaign is working on the national and local level to do so. Thanks, Tom. Gore. Thank you. <clears throat> so yes, there are really important and, and uh, effective levers at the federal level that we can use to increase housing stock in Montana. That's what we need to do. We need to increase affordable housing stock for our families because we're in this. This is happening. We can't stop it, but we need to make sure that our working families, the engine of our economies, the heart of our communities, has housing that they can afford. So number one, making sure that the Federal Housing Authority is fully funded and that we are being creative to develop new programs through that authority. Number two, the USDA Rural Housing uh, Development Program um, has programs for rural states like Montana where they support um, and uh, subsidize first-time homeowners. So that are, that's one of the biggest challenges. When I was in uh, Kalispell last night, I was talking to two young men, a logger and a construction worker, who have been saving, they grew up here, and they've been saving up for years to buy their first home, is no longer an option. Uh, so we need to make sure that the, the people who are driving our economy and keeping it intact have the housing that they need. Real estate is the highest revenue producing industry in the world. It's not about money. The money is there. Where there's a will, there's a way. And there are trillions of dollars looking for socially responsible investments. And I'm looking forward to exploring ways that the federal government can help unlock those investments and make sure that we have affordable housing and mixed use housing uh, across this district, working with governments and nonprofit organizations to get it done. Thanks, Cora. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have one more question, and then we'll transition to audience questions. One more one more preset question, then we'll transition to audience questions. Um, many of Montana's children are growing up in poverty, with almost one in four children experiencing food insecurity, which can leave have lifelong health effects for those children. What are you going to, do to provide Montana's kids the ability to grow up healthy and financially secure, and how will you 
strive for that in Congress. And we will go Tom first, then Cora, then Monica. Reinstate the child tax credit. Reinstate the child tax credit. I could say it over and over. The GOP worked with Joe Manchin to ensure that we would do what we would take away a policy that had cut child poverty in half. It is a failure of our leadership, regardless of the ability to get the votes. It's a failure of American governmental leadership to not save that program. Every time there is a possibility we can toss, we can toss a couple billion dollars to the semiconductor industry, as I saw our government do yesterday, we do it. But when it's the CTC, when it's cutting child poverty in half or increasing it by 100%, it is up for debate. It is something we see as something negotiable. And I'm tired of it. I'm honestly disgusted by it. The idea that under a democratic president, we would see this happen. It is through no fault of the people in this room. It is through no fault of Joe Biden that this has happened. But it is the fault of a culture of governance that only serves the wealthy, that sees corporations as the people we should ultimately be serving. How can we be in 2022, after a pandemic, when we're up here talking about how no one can afford a home, how the minimum wage is a poverty wage, and we're allowing, we're allowing child hunger, child poverty, to double? If I look angry, if I look animated, I don't even have kids. It's because I think about it. I think about what that means for our community, a community where parents are struggling even more. We should have an urgency around these issues. There are literally children going hungry because of our inaction. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Corey, you're next. I'm going to okay. jump for it. Yeah, time. thank you. So child poverty, I also I want to again, agree with reinstating the child tax credit. Um, I think that that's something that has lifted millions, it has lifted millions of families um, out of poverty. Uh, but I also want to reframe it. This is not just about child poverty. Here in Montana, the children and families that are going hungry are working families. This, these are your neighbors. Um, there's a huge amount of stigma around an, even admitting that children are hungry. And what we lost when we lost COVID relief was free lunches. When I was in Kalispell yesterday, I was meeting with the, the executive directors of the farm to school program, uh, the homeless and, and domestic violence shelter, the food bank. And what they are seeing is, is a rapid uptick in hunger among our working families here in Montana, only exacerbated by the housing crisis. Um, and so from the federal level, the child care tax credit, investing in SNAP programs, we're seeing an attack on working and poor families in this state, but also across the country. Making sure that in the farm, when the farm bill comes up, that we not only invest in SNAP programs, but some of the horticulture programs, which invest in the ecosystems of farm to table here in Montana. We have an agriculture sector that can bring food to the tables of our families. And there are really robust ways that we can, from the federal level, invest in those programs so that our families not only get nutritious food that they need, but that our farmers are benefiting and, and being able to grow and succeed in their operations uh, as farmers and ranchers. One of the best parts about representative democracy is that there is so much education, information, and knowledge here in Missoula alone, not to mention this entire district. So the Montana Food Bank Network is uh, just an amazing program doing great work and partnering with them to understand how the federal government can help one very concrete example that I think needs to be worked on and changed. In 2023, we will be uh, working on the Farm Bill, which is where the SNAP benefits come from. Um, does anybody know how long the SNAP application is, how many pages it is to fill out? Do you know? It's long. Exactly. So working on making it a more accessible program by ensuring that people have the resources they need to actually get those benefits when they qualify for them and they need them. And this is what we saw with the child tax credit, too. When that money became available, it was really problematic in actually getting it deployed because they required you to have filed an income tax return. And most of the people who actually qualified for it and needed it hadn't filed an income tax return. So they realized, okay, the government, they being the government, realized how can we deploy those resources, and they simplified that process. They got the money out the door to the people who needed it and lifted millions of kids out of poverty in a very short time. So as your congressional representative, the things that I will work on is making the resources that are available 
easier to access for the people who need them and work with you in the community to make that happen. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, everyone. So we're going to transition into the audience questions, and there's good ones. So what I'd like to do, we have a hard stop in here at 745 because the library closes at 8 o'clock and, and allow us to take down and get out of here. We have to be done at 745. So we're going to turn these questions into 60-second answers, some kind of rapid fire, because I'd like to get through all of them that the audience has provided. Um, so first, number one, uh, and we'll go, we'll go uh, Cora, Monica, Tom, given the divisiveness ruling the country and the state, what is your strategy to reach the swing voters needed to beat Ryan Zinke? Thank you for that question. So I'm a lifelong Democrat, but I have throughout my career in life worked with both Democrats and Republicans. And I've always said about Montanans, we are practical, not political. I was raised to, learn, to, to understand that when there's a fire or a storm, you run towards your neighbors first to make sure they're OK before anything else. And this is exactly the type of values I've brought into my work to build very diverse coalitions to get things done. And I can talk to anyone. And I love difficult conversations. I pull over on the side of the road wherever I am, talk to every business owner, guys fixing their trucks, uh, coming back in from hunting, and have conversations about what matters most to them. And that is what I think Montanans are looking for. They're looking for someone who understands the struggles they're going through and also has a track record of delivering for rural communities. Um, and so I feel confident as a Montanan in Congress um, that we can uh, heal those divisions, some of those divisions. Thanks. The things that I've done on the campaign trail already to try to uh, start this process is to meet with the Ravalli County Commissioners. They're all Republicans. And when we had the conversation, they looked at me and said, well, you don't look like a socialist. And you went to kindergarten in Mile City. so." So starting those conversations and recognizing the uh, really important things that need to have to, to happen. So I initiated a conversation with a guy who had a hat on that said, let's go, Brandon. And I started, I walked up to him and I started talking to him. And it turns out he's from Forsyth. I said, my, my sister was a fifth grade spelling bee champion of Rosebud County. And we ended up having this really great conversation. And he came up to me and he shook my hand and he said, you're my first liberal friend. <laughs> uh, last weekend, um, last week I was in Whitefish and I went to the um, All Families Health Clinic where Helen Weems is and she's doing amazing work and I went out and talked to the prote protesters and the guy has a gun on his hip and I said, I'm Monica and I don't agree with you on anything, probably, maybe some things. And we actually had a conversation and I think that is the really, really hard work, going to the farmer's markets and talking to people who think that you have two heads because you're a Democrat. And, and just having that conversation, meeting people where they are, and trying to build from the center out. And that's who we are as Montana. That's who we've always been, and that's who I am. I'm the sixth of ten kids, so it's who I am. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. Second question for the audience. Did you have a question? I didn't get to go. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm, losing, I'm totally losing my mind. I get, when a candidate goes over a little bit, I start freaking out and I lose totally. Well, I'm probably go making ahead, you freak Tom. out all the time then. Go, so ahead, go, go ahead, Tom. Uh, look, you know, the question was divisiveness and how to get, uh, you know, when Ryan Zinke, you know, we're in a district that is supposedly Republican, et cetera. We know where this is coming from. I won a district that voted for Trump plus 11 points, held by a Republican, the Speaker of the House's son. I did that in our backyard, just over there. I don't have to reinvent the wheel, but I do need to say to all of you that this idea, and I, I agree with, my, with both of you, I agree with Monica especially on this one, the hard part is, is going to the farmer's markets, but if you don't have a farmer's market in your town, it's going door to door. I knocked 10,000 doors in that campaign, allies in the Democratic Party and across the city, some of you here probably as well, got us across the finish line even more, knocking a further 10,000. It's going to the door. The divisiveness is at the larger side, the Republican versus Democrat. Most Montanans think both parties are full of it. And oftentimes they are. I have found myself talking, and so I was able to win that district doing that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel on Ryan Zinke and his corruption. But I should tell you, and I'm getting the yellow thing here. I was in Drummond at a nonpartisan event, and Monica was there as well um, at the library. And we were able, both of us, I think, to win over a skeptical crowd because we were there, because we were speaking to him. And because I was really willing to call out the bull of Ryan Zinke taking millions of dollars from oil companies. People don't like it. They don't care if you're a Democrat as long as you look like you're on their side. And we, as Democrats, and I specifically, am on their side. 
So when we talk about divisiveness, that's what's happening in Washington. Day to day, going back and forth between neighbors, we all know we deserve dignity. We know we deserve health care, roads, bridges, a government that's not corrupt. That's where I am, and that's how we win. Thanks, Al. Thanks, everyone. Next question. Mary Todd Robinson, or sorry, Mary Todd, Republican candidate, <laughs> said, I um, was just thinking about Ireland, uh, <laughs> said that climate change is not as important as other issues like inflation and gas prices. How would you respond to that? And we will go, because I skipped you, we'll go Tom, Cora, Monica. <laughs> Must be easy for her to say. You know? It's always, honestly, most of the people who have privilege are going to get through it just fine. That's the problem. It's all, we're talking, what I'm speaking to in a more folksy way is environmental justice and social justice. We are not fulfilling our duty to one another to have a more just society as we move forward. Mary Todd, whoever, she has no idea what she's talking about. And she has lost the vast majority of Montanans in her weird quest and in the Republican Party's weird quest to support the oil companies. I'm going to go back on the corruption thing, guys. Ryan Zinke went from $2 million to $32 million in his bank account while he was in public service. Had to resign from the Trump administration and 18 federal investigations into his conduct. Where do you think the money came from? Why do you think he had to leave the Trump administration? It's because he's a pawn of the oil and gas companies. It's because we have a major party, not the Democrats, it's the GOP, that is in hawk to them. The reason they can minimize it is because it's never going to be their ox being gored. They're a bunch of rich white people. It's never a problem for them. It's going to be a problem for struggling communities like Missoula, for the reservation, for single parents. And that is why it's easy for her to do that, but not for us. So I would say you can't separate the two. Both rising, rising costs for Montana families and the, the challenges we're facing already with climate change are one and the same. When our farmers and ranchers last summer during the drought had to sell off thousands of head of livestock because they didn't have the feed, that's climate change. And it's hand in hand with the, with the issues that she brought up. When our, if our rivers heat up to 82 degrees, all of the trout will, will die. What's going to happen to our outdoor recreation industry? So these two, we, can't, we only cannot separate climate change and the impact on our pocketbooks as Montanans, but the potential to bring manufacturing back to the United States to help fight inflation and to f uh, fight high prices is going to help resolve and solve some of the, the challenges we're facing with climate change. Investing in renewable energy and making sure that those industries and those companies coming into Montana are hiring locally, hiring union. Clearwater Energy recently came into Montana and brought 350 jobs. All contractors from out of state, non, none of them were union. And so these are the things that you, you can't separate the two. Um, just to be clear, the ranchers, many of whom are my clients, and one is my brother, were selling um, last year because of the consolidation of the packing companies. Um, but in terms of the question of the false dichotomy, do I have to choose between inflation, gas prices, or fixing climate? That's a false binary. It's not an either or question. We have to solve the problem of climate change or everything else doesn't matter. So the issues with inflation and with the, what people are experiencing, I think what's behind that question that Mary Todd is setting up is that people are so focused on, on their pain right now. I have to get to my job. I've got to fill up my my, you know, my minivan, whatever. But we went to Dewey, to the bar in Dewey, and the people there said, the river's low, the trout are dying, and I don't have a business anymore. So they need a business to run, which is dependent on <coughs> fixing this issue. And we can do it, and we can do all of these things together, working together. What is your opinion of the restorative justice model? whether it has any place in the criminal justice reform, and how would this look in addressing the country's highest incarceration rate in the world? Hmm? Sorry. This country's highest incarceration rate. Uh, and we will go Monica, and then Tom, and then Cora. So the, the question is, what's my opinion about the restorative justice model? I think one of the things that I would just say, I, I heard today talking to a public defender 
in Ravalli County, their model and their approach uh, toward recidivism is just put them back in jail, put people back in jail. They pull them in and they put them back in jail. So they don't want to deal with homelessness. They don't want to deal with opioid addiction. They don't want to deal with the mental health issues that are real and important. So I think figuring out what are the systemic problems that are leading to the deaths of despair and to getting people into institutions where they don't belong. We can't criminalize poverty. We can't criminalize mental health issues. We can't criminalize addiction. So I support restorative justice. I support reviewing where we are. And I am absolutely 100% opposed to private corporate prisons. That's absolutely wrong, and we need to fix that. Tom? Yeah, I think the restorative justice model, particularly in a space and in a state where, I mean, I can do it for marijuana law because I um, wrote legislation on this. Uh, if you were black in the state of Montana, you have a 10 times bigger chance of being pulled over and incarcerated for um, having marijuana in your car. You did before it was legal. Two times for Native people. Uh, restorative justice brings community members together rather than necessarily go immediately to a carceral solution. Our campaign from the beginning speaks in terms of ending the carceral state, ensuring that we don't put our tax dollars toward putting people in jail when we really are, what we're trying to do is seek retribution against people because they might look different or be poorer than us or whatever it is. Oftentimes, the will of our federal government specifically, and I'll speak to that because that's where we are in, this, in, in the congressional context, has been used to victimize especially poor and communities of color around incarceration. Montana does have one for-profit prison. It is a travesty that you would make money off of this model. It's not in line with the values of Montana communities. It's not in line with Montanans. So yes, I support restorative justice. I support ending the carceral state in all ways we can and ensuring that we don't, the first thing is to bring cops into the mix or to bring prisons into the mix. And we really have our community breakdowns in terms of inequality and poverty. Thank you. Um, I'm very supportive of the restorative justice uh, uh, model. Uh, here in Montana, in some of our communities, there are the native or indigenous Montanans are, are incarcerated at four times the rate uh, of white Montanans. This is criminalizing poverty, addiction, mental health. Addressing What we need to do is address the core problems that are in, impacting our communities. And one of the things that we're seeing now, I was just meeting, uh, when I was in Kalispell, I was meeting with the Childhood Restorative Justice uh, Program talking about the networks that we need to build around our communities and our young people and any at-risk individuals to help support them in their process of healing. So much of, of what happens when people end up in, in addiction and in the cycle of, of uh, you know, in and out of the system is because they don't have the support they need, they don't have the nutrition they need, they don't have the housing they need. And as our communities get hollowed out, um, if you all saw my Little Blue House ad, you saw my house there, um, the woman who lives there now says that only a quarter of that neighborhood is now vac is, has people living in it. So when you're raising young people in communities that have been hollowed out because of price gouging and, and the uber wealthy buying our state out from underneath us, we can't take care of each other. So we have to address those root problems, and part of that is the restorative justice model. Thank you. Uh, we talked about this a little already, but this is, uh, I think, a really important question from the audience. We started this evening with a land acknowledgement um, about our native community, but, but our native communities need more. They need action. Can you please share with us how you engage native communities across the state when developing your campaign platform? And we'll start with, we'll go back to Cora, start with Cora, then go to Monica, then Tom. Um, so as I shared, I've been really honored to, to be able to, to have worked with native communities and indigenous communities throughout my career. Um, the, the issues that are facing all of our all Montana families right now, the, lead, the leadership we have at the state level and the community level is led by our native leaders and native communities. When it comes to voting rights, when it comes to COVID relief, when it comes to things like restorative justice, nutrition, defending Medicaid expansion, you name it, the things that our Montana families need, we have indigenous native Montanans at the helm of those initiatives. And so I have been really, ha really happy and honored to partner with uh, and be mentored by some of our tribal leaders across the state. Um, it's part of the building block of my campaign, um, and we will continue to engage and, and make sure to address the issues that are most important to those communities. 
Uh, I think the question is, what did I do? What did our campaign do? To, could you? I'm sorry. Yeah, no. It. Just share with us how you engage native communities across the state when developing your platform. Okay. So, when putting together the platform that this campaign has, we met. We went and talked with our two tribes that are in, as part of this district, the Blackfeet Tribal Council and the CSKT, and we met with them um, several times. And one of the very specific issues that I have worked on and dealt with is. Um, broadband availability on our reservations. So um, the Three Rivers Co-op sold its exchange to Browning. It's now called the SAE Exchange. In that exchange, Three Rivers held back eight and a half million dollars of what they call capital credits. So there's a lawsuit happening right now to transfer that so it goes with the people who are a member of that, um, of the broadband group. It's now called the SAE Exchange. So making sure that our, um, our communities have the resources that they need, but listening, because the education, the culture, the language, and the history is, is, belongs to the people. And all I can do is listen and learn. And our issues page, monicatrinnell.com, is more fully developed than any other candidate in this campaign. Please go to it and see it, and you will learn for yourselves what we did. Thank you. Uh, you know, to this question, there's many ways to go here. One, you know, the, what you must do at first is show up, not just beyond, you know, beyond just running for Congress. I actually work in broadband provision for rural and tribal communities. I've, it's taken a back seat while I have to drive with a chicken around in my truck. But we have worked with rural and tribal communities and tribal colleges to bring broadband to those areas. And what that comes from, again, is humility. The knowledge that the issues around native sovereignty, around health care, especially around not funding the IHS, which we still don't do and I would do in Congress, those things come up on the doors. I live on the reservation myself. Again, I'm not a native person myself as well. However, I'm a part of this community. I am going door to door on the reservation. I am going door to door speaking with native people directly about what they need. And here's what comes up. Universal health care. The United States government in all of our treaties guarantees Native Americans health care, which we do not provide, which Congress has not put the money towards. My campaign fights for universal health care because that would bring health care to every American community, regardless of ethnicity. But it would disproportionately impact, in a positive way, struggling rural communities like the native, like native reservations. I should just say on this issue, and I want to reiterate, the issues that our campaign fights for without, do, do not erase divisions or differences in race or ethnicity between people, but we fight for universal values. Right now, we ration health care specifically for poor native people. And my campaign wants to stop that. And that's coming from those communities' demands for dignity. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. OK. Uh, we made it. Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, uh, Tom, Cora, Monica, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for giving us the opportunity in Missoula to get to know you a little bit. You can clap now if you'd like. <laughs> uh, I wish you all the best of luck in the remainder of the primary. Uh, and before we finish up with one last closing question that I would really like to pose to you, uh, and we're going to have to make it quick so we can get out of here, but I have a couple announcements that we must make. Five days from now on May 16th, the Missoula County Democrats will host a forum for all Missoula County legislative races and with primary contests. Please come back to this room at 6 p.m. to hear from some of our excellent candidates. Outside the room right now, there are tickets for sale for the Missoula County Democrats' Williams Dinner, which is a fundraiser for all Missoula Democratic candidates running for office. The dinner will take place on June 4th and will feature Jennifer Palmieri as the guest speaker, a keynote speaker. Please take a look and consider attending. And last but certainly not least, the primary election is on June 7th. Please check your voter registration. You can do that at app.montana.gov slash voter info. Uh, there are folks out there at the table that can help you with that right now. If you're not registered, please register to vote in the primary. All right, for the last question, which we will go Tom, Cora, Monica, just across the stage here. Um, it is June 8th. You won. You are the primary candidate. What are you going to do to beat Ryan Zinke? 60 seconds on the clock. 60 seconds will, 60 seconds will turn around this entire ship. Here we go, guys. America's fixed. Look, if we have won this primary, it means that the dignity inherent in Montana communities is alive and well, and they are demanding it. Again, we are the only campaign who recognizes that we ration health care for poor people, that we ration health care for our neighbors, 
We are the only campaign signed on to the Green New Deal because we know that the only way to move forward is to ensure that justice is served to the communities who've been most impacted by climate change already. We are the only campaign, or previously my campaign was the first to unionize in this state because I believe in a dignified wage for all people. If we have won, it means that we will win because, the, because Montanans have stood up and recognized and demanded the dignity that they are denied so often, all the time, from Republicans, but oftentimes from corporate Democrats who have taken over our party and oftentimes nationally have done what they can to harm our constituents. We don't lose here because we are bad at it. We don't lose because our hearts are in it. We only lose because we have lost the narrative. And if we win this primary, we win against Zinke because we have found what it means to bring dignity to our communities and our politics again. If I win this primary, it will be based on the values of honesty, integrity, and working together with Montanans to build a strong base and a groundswell of support. I won't engage in attack ads or going after my opponents. I will win this fair and square. My campaign currently is the only campaign that's keeping pace with Ryan Zinke. I've been in the top 10% of, of uh, performing campaigns in the country out of all Democratic challengers. We are keeping pace with Ryan Zinke on fundraising, which is going to be what it takes uh, to win this campaign. We have a really incredible group of endorsers uh, from uh, Mike Cooney, Mel Haynes, Jim Larson, DeShane Barnett, um, tribal union health and elected leaders across the state, and we'll continue to build that uh, support uh, to build a district-wide groundswell um, that, not, that money can't address. Um, that's the grassroots organizing and coalition building I've done throughout my career and that I will do to beat Ryan Zinke. I have beat him before on public lands. I can beat him again. And tonight I want to ask all of you uh, for your support in the June 7th primary. So thank you. Number one, I will roll out the endorsements of Republicans and independents who have already called me and given me money and said, I know Ryan Zinke, and I know you, and we need you to win. Uh, number two, I will look at places like Missoula, 52 precincts in Missoula. I um, outperformed every Democrat in Montana in 2020. And in Missoula, I lost 14 precincts by a big margin. 64% of the vote in Missoula is not enough. We have to move that up to 70, and we're going to do that by getting out to Frenchtown and Bonner and Lolo and the places in those precincts that we're losing. And number three, we've got to go and say we're going to out, oh, out, overperform, outperform in our rural counties. In Lincoln County, we have to go across 30% of the vote there. We have to do it. And I met with the mayor of Troy who said, you're the only Democrat I voted for. I figure a lady shows up here twice. She must want that job pretty bad. Ravalli County has 10,000 Democrats, the same number as Butte. We have to show up there, talk to them, energize them. There is no path to victory on a Democrat-only platform. We've got to have the persuadable voters. We have to energize our base. It's both. And doing both of those things, which I can do, and I have a proven track record of doing here in seven of the 16 counties in this district, we will win. Thank you. Let's thank our candidates very much.